Hello, and a very warm welcome to COVID-19 Updates from Singapore. My name is Caitlin Wee, and I'm a third-year medical student at NUS Yong Lulin School of Medicine. This is a series of webinars presented by NUS Yong Lulin School of Medicine, National University Health System, and Global Outbreak Alert and Response Network. The COVID-19 Updates from Singapore weekly webinar series will provide viewpoints and insights from a panel of leading experts in infectious diseases and related specialties and disciplines. It is now my honour to introduce you to our moderator, who is also the programme director of this series. Recruited to establish an infectious disease training programme in Singapore, he was the first infectious diseases head of department in the Communicable Disease Centre here in 1992. He is currently Associate Vice President for Health Innovation and Transformation, National University of Singapore. Ladies and gentlemen, Associate Professor David Allen. Thank you, Caitlin. Good evening and welcome to the 23rd installment of our webinar, COVID-19 Updates from Singapore. We thank you for including our webinar in your weekly schedule. We make every effort to make, your, uh, make sure your time with us is well spent. Uh, as a reminder, after tonight's episode, there's only one episode left. Please be sure that you've registered uh, for that episode and that you tune in next week for the grand finale. The topic for tonight's discussion will be COVID-19, September 2020, The Way Forward. Our guest expert this week to help us explore that subject is Dr. Michael Ryan, whom I'll formally introduce after Dale's epidemiology update. Our format this week will be, uh, Dale will start us off with a uh, epidemiology update. Following that, I'll have a discussion with Dr. Ryan on this evening's topic. Please do send in your questions um, and, and the country from which you're watching. We'll get to as many of your questions as possible. Uh, after the uh, discussion, Dale and I will, uh, uh, Dale will have a weekly review of current events and following which I'll provide a preview of next week's episode and reveal of the mystery pandemic song of the week. Again, please send in your questions in the country from which you're viewing. It's now my pleasure to introduce Dale. Uh, Dale Fisher is Professor of Medicine, National University of Singapore, Yong Lu Lin School of Medicine, Senior Consultant, Division of Infectious Disease at National University Hospital, and Chair of the Global Outbreak Alert and Response Network hosted by World Health Organization. Dale, over to you. Thank you, David. I'll just uh, share my screen. Tell me I'm all good to go. Not yet. Uh, try try that yep. one. Yep. Good. Okay, great. So uh, as it's the second last episode, David, I thought we probably should do things slightly differently. Um, I think uh, you're all familiar with the Johns Hopkins dashboard that I always start off, but uh, our first uh, uh, our first webinar, I'm pretty sure, was on uh, on April 9. So I I pulled out one of these uh, Johns Hopkins from from uh, from the the sixth uh, of April. So really, you can see during the duration of the show that we've gone from 1.2 million cases in the world to the 27 million and the 69 deaths to the 900,000. And I'm I'm not sure we would have predicted that, but uh, nonetheless, it's uh, it's contrast, and uh, we can see what the global epi curve looked like at the time. This is. Uh, this is also back on the, the 10th of April. And you can see the, the number of cases were about 80,000 per day. We know it's, uh, it's uh, more like 20 times that now. Um, and look, you can see China and that little catch up of cases that they had back there in February. And uh, of course, you look at the global epi curve now and, and there's China down there with the, all you can see is that little cases of catch up. So, so um, as uh, Michael recognized these, these are, uh, uh, the WHO uh, uh, epi data that's uh, produced every day and distributed, and we've been very grateful to be able to use these through the through the webinar series. You can see the main. Uh, this uh, came up a, a week or two ago with India now having the the most cases per day, ninety thousand with with a thousand deaths, um, and the uh, the purple uh, bar here correspondingly becoming larger, but. Uh, but uh, globally, the number of cases being diagnosed is, is about the same and the deaths are, are pretty consistent as well. With the epi curves, we're pretty comfortable. The trajectories are, are pretty much the same. Americas have been coming down for a little while. Southeast Asia, 
complements of India is uh, particularly is, is still on the way up. Europe's uh, increasing cases, particularly in young people, while keeping its, its deaths down. Um, and the other ones you can see along the, the bottom there. Just to, to uh, expand on these a little bit, uh, you can see these are, are the Americas. And, and the interesting thing, again, is just uh, over the last week, these large number of cases per million population uh, and with it uh, consistently double digit deaths per million population. Um, but it's, uh, it, it's, it's pretty flat, as I mentioned, if anything, US might be coming down a little bit. Um, and in, uh, in, in talking about the, the, the US, uh, it's, um, it's um, uh, two, two major events, I guess, over the last week. You remember last week, I, I spoke about the, the university students and uh, uh, how they were returning, or maybe it was the week before, and they were, they were, uh, there was a lot of concern. Well, now there's about 51,000 uh, students uh, affected across a thousand campuses in the US. Um, no, no, no deaths that, uh, that, that I know of. Um, but uh, they're, they're doing what university students do really, right? They, uh, they, they mingle, they go to bars, they, they often come from different parts of the, of the country. So we know that's a, that mingling is a, is a great way to, to, to make things happen and, and uh, to make transmission ramp up. So there's a lot of mingling from different parts of the country. Um, there's testing delays. Um, e even if people are, are found positive, they're still going off to their frat parties and things, uh, the reports say. Um, this was an interesting one. This was the Sturgis Motorcycle Rally. A report came out about this on Tuesday. This is uh, in, in South Dakota, where 460,000 uh, motorbike enthusiasts uh, traveled. So you can see there's very few masks. There's, there's no distancing. And this study did uh, use mobile phone data to work out where everyone had come from, looked at the difference, the, any spike in case numbers afterwards, and calculated that there'd, uh, there'd been about 263,000 cases as a result of this, this huge gathering. Um, now, there's criticism of the methodology, but, uh, but nonetheless, it's, uh, it, it's out there. And they've, they've estimated that this... Uh, has cost about 12.2 billion in public health costs. So pretty uh, remarkable e event and, and subsequent uh, evaluation, which is easily found online. As we go to, to Southeast Asia, um, we, we spoke about this curve a minute ago. Um, you can see Myanmar's uh, climbing, India and Indonesia are, are all in the, in the pink zones. So, uh, and the shape of the curves explaining the the, the main one um, mentioned last last week that uh, Napidor, the capital of Myanmar, has been uh, special measures put in there in terms of trying to isolate it off. I guess it's where all the politicians live, uh, but but they're uh, trying to wall themselves off a bit from the rest of Myanmar by restricting travel in there and and doing tests and and I think quarantine at the same time. So, so I, also in uh, the Southeast Asian region. Uh, you remember I showed this uh, this last week. This is Thailand having 100 days without local COVID infection. Well, straight after the show, I saw this. So you remember our show goes 3rd of September, 7 till 8 p.m. So uh, I'm wrong. They've had their first case in 100 days. And, uh, and uh, but, but seriously, the, to get this reported during the show, it was a 37-year-old man who who was actually put in prison uh, for, for drug offences. He was, so he was screened uh, as a routine. He's a DJ that had worked at three venues in the preceding 14 days. They found 600 contacts, um, uh, quarantined 400 of them, but they found no other positive cases. So it's another one of these mystery events where a, a, a country is, uh, has had none, uh, and then it's, it's reappeared and we've postulated importation on, on frozen and refrigerated food and things like that. But, but actually this case seems completely isolated. He hasn't even spread it, although obviously being a fairly, um, fairly affable chap. Um, okay, uh, Indonesia, I thought I might just uh, drop that one in as well. You can see that they've had a lot of trouble with, with testing and things there. The, but, but, but now that it, as it ramps up, Bali and Java are, are, are the hotspots. 
although that, again, that may just be availability of testing. There's a fair bit of prejudice coming in. Um, apparently healthcare workers and their families are, are, are having uh, problems. Uh, migrant workers returning um, are, are also sort of being, crowds are trying to stop them coming back because of the risk of introducing COVID. So there's a lot of um, community engagement needed there as well. Um, they're reinstating semi-lockdowns in Jakarta and there's major concerns over their hospital bed capacity and their ICU bed capacity, which is now at about 80%. And they've suggested that with current trends in about a week, they'll, they'll have, uh, have gone beyond their capacity. Uh, the European region, again, this is same as always. We've got all these remarkably increased number of cases, but, uh, but because they're mostly in young people, I presume, maybe Mike can comment on this later, but it's, uh, it's incredible that uh, the, this low fatality rate, um, and, and again, you can, you can see that these are not like the numbers in the Americas and, and these incredible uh, low, low digits. Look, you can look, uh, France and UK have only got uh, one per million death per day. So it's, um, it's really um, uh, palatable in a way, if, if, if deaths are palatable. Um, so uh, if we look at France and UK, they're actually very similar uh, epidemiologically. UK's had about 355 cases and 41,000 deaths. Um, France has had 344,000 uh, cases and 30,000 deaths. So, so not too far away. Uh, UK uh, is ramping up its, its social restrictions again in the, I guess, in the wake of the summer holidays. Um, their, their gatherings are now, they were 30 people, they're now down to six people although it doesn't apply to schools and workplaces and, and COVID secure weddings, funerals and organized team sports, it says. But uh, there's a, they've doubled the fine for ignoring the police. It's now a hundred pounds and it goes up with each offense. Uh, in France, the, the prime minister's now in, in quarantine, having, having spent time with the, uh, the, the boss of the Tour de France. So he spent uh, part of the weekend there with him and, uh, he was diagnosed positive, so, so now the Prime Minister of France is in, in quarantine. Eastern Mediterranean, I've got nothing specific to report from this area. Again, you can see though that the, the deaths per million is, is significantly less than that first chart, which was the, the Americas, but uh, a, lot of, a lot of red here. There's a lot of, a lot of cases and, and my understanding is a, a, lo a lot of problems with, with community buy-in. Um, uh, Africa, uh, similar, tra a remarkable trend down in the number of cases, Ethiopia up, South Africa down, um, and, and deaths um, uh, sort of a, a quantum below um, some of the other regions. Um, and again, these, the, these low death rates, at least, that's what's, uh, what's been uh, reported. So let's come to the Western Pacific area where we live, um, as we know, um, Philippines, Japan, in fact, I'll, I'll come to these, these curves. Um, again, low numbers of, of uh, deaths per million, uh, lots of blue, uh, lots of case numbers coming down, uh, down across the board. So let's look at some of those countries. Um, Malaysia has done really well. Remember the, the blue ones here are, are the cases, um, yellow of uh, discharged people for some reason I put that on here, but the blue is the number of cases uh, that had a, had a recent spike um, these are due to a couple of clusters, um, so it's not always as bad as it seems when I think for the first time in ages, they, that's probably for the first time since about eight, early May, they've reported 100 cases in a day. This is uh, in um, Sabah, so this is the Bentang Lahad Datu cluster. Uh, this is a police station with a, a, um, a lockup uh, and, and an associated uh, um, prison, if you like, where detainees for illegal immigrants as well as prisoners. Um, and uh, this is up in Kedar, up in the, the, the northwest of, um, of, uh, of Malaysia, where Lang uh, just including Langkawi. Um, so this is a, a private medical centre which has had some uh, a healthcare worker outbreak and, and also some family clusters related to that. So, so that's largely what this 100 is all about. It's not, it's not just uh, free flowing through the community. Uh, and again, you can see that uh, Hong Kong's come down nicely, uh, Japan's coming down nicely, Philippines, South Korea. So um, 
So uh, Hong Kong, I said uh, uh, last week that they'd brought it down to, to, to single digits um, and that they'd reopened gyms and extended restaurant times till 10. Now they're increasing the number of tables. You can have four people at a table instead of two and they're, they're opening museums and mahjong parlors and ice skating rinks and, and lots of um, other sporting facilities. The voluntary mass testing has not been as successful as they'd hoped. Only about 20% of the population, 1.4 million, have gone for the voluntary testing. So they're, they're extending that because they still feel there's community cases that they want to get a handle on. Um, Philippines, there's been quite a lot of clusters there in the, in the, the dozens, in healthcare facilities, in prisons, in these things called business process outsourcing companies, BPOs. Um, so one of the more controversial things they've started doing is monitoring social media, looking for words like parties and get together. And that's uh, caused a bit of a backlash because the, this is uh, an infringement on, on my rights. Yeah. So um, South Korea, I said this would be an interesting one to watch. Um, and, and they've done it again. I think it's fantastic. I think the problem is they like to push the envelope and everything's open and they and try and get back to normal and then, then another cluster appears. But this was largely in churches, coffee shops. It involved older people this time, so, so we'll probably see more deaths. Um, but they, I was talking to a reporter from South Korea the other day and he said, 100%, everyone is still isolated. They've created dormitories and things. They don't let positive cases back into the, back into the population. Um, August 27, they peaked at 441 cases. Now they're back at about 150. And they've done this just by closing karaoke and buffets and museums and schools and increased work from home. Uh, restaurants have to close at nine o'clock, um, decreased gatherings down to 10. So, um, so uh, I, I guess the message I'm trying to give is that all these, all these countries are, are really just nuancing their social um, restrictions to, to bring it down. And, and I think that's, uh, that's part of the secret to success. Okay, so to Singapore to, to close out, um, the dormitories still, still puttering along with small numbers of cases, but the community um, been single digit for a very long time, imported cases all in quarantine when diagnosed are, are there. So um, ni nice numbers here. Um, and I can tell you, uh, I, I went searching through all the old sit reps. Um, Singapore hasn't had, uh, the last ICU discharge was on August the 5th. So uh, it's been many weeks since an ICU case and the last death was on July 13. So 27 deaths for 57,000 cases, um, just 34 in Singapore hospitals now. So um, that's it for the EPI update and uh, look forward to hearing what Mike's got to say. Great, Dale. Just a quick, quick, quick question. Um, Sturgis, uh, there's 450,000 of them or so. Uh, they're like wildebeests, I guess, migrating in Africa. Um, but they're all outdoors. I thought that was safe. Or you're saying they go indoors at night and drink beer? Uh, I just report it like it is, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, Dale. We'll get back to you later in the show. Okay. Uh, it's, it's now my uh, great honor to introduce our guest expert tonight. He's uh, Dr. Michael Ryan. He's Executive Director, World Health Organization, Health Emergencies Program. Uh, he first joined uh, WHO in 1996. He's worked in conflict-affected affect uh, countries and has led many uh, responses for high-impact outbreaks. He's founding member of the Global Outbreak Alert and Response Network, uh, uh, for which he was later the director, and Dale is now the chair. Um, he's also previously served in World Health Organization's Coordinator of Epidemic Response, uh, uh, Operational Coordinator of their response to SARS back in 2003, and uh, was Senior Advisor on Polio Eradication. He's worked in Ebola and measles and major epidemics throughout the world. The title of our discussion this evening with Mike will be COVID-19 Pandemic, September 2020, The Way Forward. Mike, welcome to the show. Well, thanks very much. Uh, and Dale is certainly going to be a hard act to follow, but we'll try. <laughs> All right, let's, let's just jump right in. Uh, how does uh, WHO work in emergencies and what do you do? Um, well, we have a we have a program that's based at essentially four levels in the world. We have a global program here in Geneva. 
We have six regional uh, programs embedded in the uh, our regional offices for WHO. And then we have a country presence in 147 countries. Uh, and in many countries like Yemen, like Syria, uh, Somalia, Congo, we'll have sub offices uh, right out in the field uh, as close as possible to uh, people uh, suffering from emergencies. So we, we, we both work on acute emergencies and responding to anything from natural disasters right the way through to epidemics. But we're also heavily involved in maintaining essential health services in places like Yemen, in Libya, in Syria, uh, Afghanistan, uh, and other places. So our work stretches right across the emergency spectrum, from preparedness to response, natural disasters uh, to epidemics uh, and conflict. Uh, so it's a very, very wide ranging uh, mandate uh, and, and a quite a demanding one. But we couldn't do this work, uh, honestly. We are a kind of a nerve center, a hub, a platform. A lot of the work that we do is through instruments and, and platforms like Gorn, the work that Dale does and the Gorn partners around the world for outbreak response. We have a, glo a global health cluster of humanitarian agencies who work on health issues. So in a sense, we're the center of a spider's web uh, in, in a way in hoping to set standards and direct response to, to uh, emergencies and pre preparation for emergencies. But uh, ultimately, most of our impact is leveraged through fantastic institutions from all over the world uh, who work with us to ensure that we can deliver the best possible service to vulnerable people. Mm. And and what role is, uh, what role do you have in all of this? You're you're the, yeah, for, of the you're the spider. For my uh, for my for my sins, uh, I've been elevated to my own personal level of managerial incompetence. You know, you can't stay a scientist forever. There, you know, they eventually promote you into management. You know? God, God forbid. <laughs> uh, so yes, I sit at the. Uh, the center of that spider's web. I, I'm the executive director uh, for the emergencies program. Um, we have two divisions, uh, response and uh, preparedness. And I report directly to uh, the director general of WHO and to the governing bodies of, of the organization. We have 194 member states. So in effect, that's our, sh our, our shareholders are the member states, the, all of the countries in the world and their citizens uh, and their ministries of health. And in a sense, we're a secretariat. We provide services uh, to our member states based on what they set as our priorities. In fact, we don't set the priorities for our organization. It is the states, it is Singapore, it is uh, the United States, it's China, it's France, it's the Cook Islands, it's wherever you want to be. Those ministers come together every single year and they essentially lay out what they want the World Health Organization to do in terms of policy, in terms of normative standards, and in terms of emergency preparedness. Mm -hmm. What have we learned from past, uh, past emergencies? Or didn't learn? <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. It's, 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 I, I suppose uh, it's, it's, we've learned a lot uh, in many ways uh, about those events and those epidemics and those crises. Uh, I would argue that we haven't implemented a whole lot of those learnings. If you think lesson learned, we all, we hear this pejorative term lessons learned. We learned lots of lessons. Let's have a lesson learning exercise. Uh, I, frankly, I'm beginning to get a little bit uh, cynical about this. I spent 25 do years doing this, and we learned lessons uh, after the first Ebola outbreaks in Kikwit, and we learned lessons after SARS and MERS, and we learned lessons uh, after the West Africa Ebola outbreak. And in some cases, we've implemented some of those lessons. And I would commend Singapore and places like South Korea, who really did learn uh, from the SARS and MERS experiences, and really did internalize, both in government and in science and in the community, the threat that these diseases represented, and actually invested in the infrastructure and the workforce to prepare for and respond to these things. So yes, I think we've learned, I think an ounce of preparation is worth a ton of response. Uh, I think we've learned that the animal human interface is a very, very dangerous barrier right now for our global civilization. We've learned that um, we need to manage our planet, manage our economy. Uh, we need to accept that globalization has brought a lot of benefits. And Singapore is a, is a state that exists based on trade and based on accessing markets. But with that advantage and with that prosperity comes risk. And I would argue that we have not managed the risks that have come with the benefits of creating a connected world. Uh, and we have underinvested, serial underinvestment in managing those risks uh, and in mitigating those risks, mainly in terms of preparedness 
we tend to have created very static preparedness. You know, we build labs and we, we, we construct things. But we've underinvested in the, the muscle on those bones, the workforce, that dynamic capacity to respond, the decision-making architecture, the communications and risk communications, those dynamic uh, capacities. We tend to build a lab, we build hospitals, we add more beds. We do those things and we count those up and we cut a yellow ribbon. But the true essence of effective preparedness and response to a crisis is the way in which data is collected, the way in which decisions are made, the capacity to make decisions quickly, the capacity to cr uh, create new science, uh, build new evidence, and turn that evidence into policy and turn that policy into concrete action. That muscle memory. And what I can see very often, um, David, is a that very often it's only really the countries that have been through the heart of a big emergency. They develop that muscle memory and they develop that aversion to this happening again and they invest. And for others, it can be a, a remote concept. And I just hope, really dearly hope that this time around, all countries can look to the threat we face and we can all learn from this horrific experience and that we don't have to be back where we are now um, uh, in, in the future. Having said that, there's some fantastic things going on. What you're doing today, this collaboration, the amount of connectivity, collaboration, consultation, sharing that's going on in the world, uh, maybe there is a, a better and brighter future for, for global public health. If, if people were aware, you said certain countries responded and you did mention a couple in uh, Asia, and I'll get to that in just a moment if that's a unique aspect, but uh, these other countries, they saw this, they were, they were aware of it, they were prompted, they were educated. Why didn't they do it? They're smart people. They are not, they are, these are generally not unintelligent people. Was there, is it a lack of money? Is it a lack of, what is it? Everybody in the beginning was uh, a little uh, caught off guard. People, uh, d their systems were at different levels of activation. I think there was a very high level, and there has been since the pandemic in 2009 and since SARS and MERS. I would argue, and you, you're based there in, in Asia, but I get a sense that Asian countries have a much higher sense of alert to these kinds of viruses and respiratory viruses in particular. And it triggers a collective community disquiet. And governments are expected to be ready for this kind of event. This is very high on the list of priorities of citizens. And that converts into a commitment on behalf of government. I, I also think that public health systems around the world have developed in different ways. And all public health is good. But in many countries, I would argue, uh, and I'd be very happy to be challenged on this, public health in, many, in a number of countries, particularly in industrialized countries, have, has become more of a policy frame or a policy platform. It's not hands-on field epi. It's not that interventionist public health where you have you know, contact tracing and all of that outbreak intervention because epidemics are a rare enough occurrence in many industrialized countries. So public health is much more to do with science. It's much more to do with policy. And when faced with an overwhelming acceleration in cases, many systems, uh, the public health component of their systems was just not able to cope with the huge number of cases, the, nest, the need to investigate clusters, the number of contacts that were to be followed up on a daily basis. We know from dealing with Ebola, um, uh, in, in the last outbreak of Ebola in Congo, at one point we were tracing, tracking 25,000 contacts a day in the middle of a war zone. And we were being heavily criticized by donors when our efficiency in contact tracing dropped below 90% of people seen every day. I would love to apply that metric to some of the industrialized countries now, especially some of the ones who were, were giving us a hard time over our performance in Congo. Uh, but uh, I do think that the muscle memory for that kind of basic public health intervention is still present in many developing countries. And I think Asian countries have invested, uh, retained, as they've developed more sophisticated scientific systems, I think they have retained core elements of that traditional public health architecture, infection prevention and control, contact tracing, and have been able to leverage larger resources into training contact tracers, into following up. And I also think uh, there's a lot more community acceptance of that. I think communities in Asia expect the government to do that. I think they expect the government to be interventionist. I think they, they see that as a responsible action on behalf of government 
Whereas in other countries, that was seen as intrusive. That was seen as the state interfering in many cases with the, the lives of individuals. And that's become a, a lightning rod issue in many countries. What is the level of interference in people's lives an interruption in people's lives that's acceptable uh, in the situation of an epidemic, particularly if a large proportion of the population don't perceive that to be severe. Uh, so I think there, there are lots of reasons why. Um, this, there was a lot of, the introductions in Europe were very silent. The disease had established itself um, uh, to a great extent before people realized what was happening. Whereas the alert to Singapore and, and South Korea, Japan and others, the minute in, in, in the first week of January, uh, I can tell you the number of phone calls that I got from, from public health practitioners in Asia going, you know, what's going on? What's the story? There was a, an immediate um, level of concern just went through the roof and action started to be taken. And I think if further away from the epicenter, there was maybe a sense that uh, we well, let's see what happens. And uh, 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 the disease entered silently and had established itself. The fire had started to burn underground before most systems had the time to react mm. uh, and nobody everyone i honestly i honestly think that everyone in this has tried to do their best uh the problem is sometimes your best is not good enough if you don't have the infrastructure if you haven't made the investment in advance i could decide to go out and try and run a marathon tomorrow myself and dale actually we probably could do a training for marathons um i could try i could decide to go out and do that and no matter what my will was and no matter what my intent was I would not finish that marathon because I have not prepared to do that. So goodwill aside and best intentions aside, your performance is always dependent on your preparation. So, so without criticizing individuals who've reacted yeah. and without turning this into a polemic saying who did right and who did wrong, the mistakes in this response are everywhere and they're, they're, they're global and they're temporal. Mistakes in preparation have been made probably for decades. Uh, uh, and therefore, I think much of the failure collectively at global level is in a failure to prepare, not in a failure to respond. Uh, but both have had an impact on this response. There, there will invariably be post-mortems or already mortems at, uh, before the post is done. Uh, is anything good going to come from the post-mortems? No matter who's responding to what, there should always be interaction reviews. There should always be operational reviews. We, during the last Ebola crisis in Congo, where I think we had nine operational reviews during it, we constantly carry out reviews of our operations. So there are different types of reviews, David. There's those reviews that need to happen, and I'm sure they're in, in individual hospitals will sit down on a weekly basis, and they'll do their, their grand rounds, and they'll do their mortality rounds, and they'll do... Everyone should be evaluating performance all the time. Um, the question when you talk about mortems and postmortems is the political postmortems you're probably referring to more than anything else, mm. um, the high level ones. And, and we have to be careful. It is important that we learn the lessons, and it is important that we learn the lessons in real time so we don't forget. But it's also important that those postmortems in themselves don't disrupt the response and become polemics and witch hunts in which the very people that need to respond are, are interrupted in that response. Uh, because they're distracted into a, a form of postmortem. So yes, operational review. Yes, we learn the lessons, but we also need to be careful. What is the purpose of doing that? The purpose should be to learn. The purpose should be to share experience. Um, and uh, if we do it with that spirit in mind, at whatever level, local, national, global, then I believe we have a positive outcome. Um, I do think it's important now, uh, especially with the way things are going, that again at national level, the many governments, and I must say I commend governments across most of the world, uh, where governments in power and oppositions have come together. Uh, people have laid down their political weapons and decided to have a national sort of response uh, and have supported opposition, have supported governments. There's been some criticism, but in the main, we've seen a very responsible uh, approach. Uh, it would be unfortunate at this point if that was to descend now into some form of uh, political infighting. Uh, our citizens don't need that. Our citizens don't need our politicians fighting each other over who's to blame while this virus is still here killing. Let me just shift gears just a bit. Um, Sebastian Moore-Stro, a Deputy Executive Director of Research and sen uh, Senior Principal Investigator at ASTAR in Singapore, asks, 
How important is real-time sharing of viral genomic data for monitoring the virus? Um, I think it is important and that we've probably never, we've never seen the extent uh, of uh, virus sharing that we've seen in real time for, for this virus. In fact, uh, the initial sharing of the virus sequences and the laboratory assays allowed us all to develop the tests that were needed. So first of all, we need to continue to share virus sequences because we need to be able to test with this virus. And as the virus evolves, our tests need to move along with that. It's the same when it comes to understanding the virus in terms of transmission dynamics and understanding whether or not transmission dynamics or lethality dynamics change, pathophysiology, target organs. So it's not just doing the sequencing. I think this is probably the important point there is to link shifts and changes in the virus to real world outcomes and be able to associate the geographic and the temporal and the pathophysiologic realities with the changes because the viruses change all the time. They're changing, you know, there are millions and millions of changes and one virus infects the person, the virus that leaves the body of an individual is not the same virus that entered that person. So the question is, what is the clinical, operational, public health and policy relevance of any given change? And that's where we do need the laboratory scientists and the geneticists working with the epidemiologists and the public health people to understand the real world implications in the shift in virus, uh, in virus structure. Um, and I think that's been good. I think we've seen a lot of very rational that we have a special group working specifically on genetic evolution, but that's linked to a group that's working on lab diagnostics, which is linked to our clinical group, which is linked to our epi group. So we come together regularly in multidisciplinary groups to say, okay, let's look this month at the relevance clinically of these shifts or changes in the virus sequence. And I think putting that together, um, it's fantastic. And, I, and I, again, in terms of looking for therapeutics, this is a potentially for the future, being able to use the genetic sequence to, 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 to model the, 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 the structure of the proteins in the virus and being able to then develop the kind of targeted molecules that may be needed for therapeutics. So I think we haven't, been, we haven't even begun to explore yet the value of sequencing as part of, as a central piece, both of disease control and countermeasure development. But WHO has been supporting those efforts. Uh, very much so yeah, since yeah. day one. I mean, since day yeah. one. Uh, yeah. and, uh, that, but it needs more investment. And, and certainly, um, you know, you'll, as we've seen in the beginning, the, the early sharing of that, we don't, we don't curate the, the virus uh, sequences. Yeah. Uh, that's done by many uh, platforms around the world who deserve great credit for that. But I would say that we need to continue to push for the open, early, and transparent sharing of not only the, the virus sequences, but also of the viruses themselves. Because we, again, do not want this to become, you know, and especially in a crisis, over-commercialized or subject to, to restrictive rules on the sharing of these things. And, you know, we've got to respect things like the Nagoya Protocol, the Biodiversity Protocols. We've got the issues of intellectual property. And then balancing that, we've got the issues of global threat. And we need to find a, a, a stable and predictable mechanism whereby virus sequences and viruses can be shared in, per, in perpetuity, uh, especially around these uh, dangerous epidemic, uh, high threat epidemic. Uh, and, and this is something that's real. Uh, it's live. Um, and I do believe it's a discussion that needs to continue uh, in order to be sure that this sharing that we've seen in this response continues into the future. Let's jump again. Will social cohesion be important for us getting out of this? Do you see a difference in how countries manifest social cohesiveness? Yeah, I, I, I see differences in that, and I see very much differences in the, in the social contract that people have with government, uh, regardless of the political uh, uh, system. Um, it, it, it depends how you how we talk about the idea of social cohesion. Um, there's no question that communities who feel that they're in something together and whose instinct is towards collective re threat and a collective response and sense themselves as intimately part of a community and not separate to that community, communities in that situation tend to absorb information in a more positive way and they tend to take action in a more positive and sustained way. Societies in which the individual uh, is seen as the most important unit of society 
uh, as opposed to the community or the household or the village. Uh, in situations like that, uh, that leads to a lot of independence, that leads to a lot of freedom, but it also may lead to a situation where individuals don't feel that sense of responsibility within their community or society. And therefore the issue becomes, what does this mean for me? What's the transmission risk for me? Uh, will the vaccine work for me? Uh, is my travel important for me? Rather than ask the question, is my travel dangerous for somebody else? Is my attending that event dangerous for something else? Is my taking the vaccine a good thing for my community? And it really depends how individuals see themselves and see themselves within a society. And in a, um, my, my view is societies in this response that have a high level of social cohesion uh, and a high level of social consent uh, as a group to what's happening from the government's perspective have done generally done better because they've absorbed advice more quickly They've sustained the implementation of that advice over time, uh, and they're, they're staying the course a lot better than societies with a more individualistic view on the world. But that, that again, that's, that's for me, I have no hard evidence to give you on that. There. that that's my sense from looking at this from the helicopter view of, uh, in, in Geneva. So correct me if I'm wrong, and I probably am, the option to social cohesiveness is lockdowns and, and, and uh, blocking borders, closing borders? Well, I mean, if we think about this in epidemiologic terms, what, what's a lockdown other than separating everybody from everybody else? It's basically saying we don't know what we, it, it, it's saying we don't know where the virus is um, and we can't, we can't stratify the risk enough. So therefore everyone's got to stay home. So we're going to, we're going to stop the virus moving from person to person uh, by separating every person from every other person. If you take the opposite view and you say, well, we do know that this virus spreads in very particular circumstances, and that if people stay uh, at least one meter apart, and if they wear masks, and if they wash their hands, and if they avoid crowded places, that will stop the virus. And if you accept that premise, then your success is almost 100% based on society's willingness to keep those rules. And in that sense, a lockdown could be seen as a lack of faith that the community can actually do it by themselves. Right. Correct. <laughs> yep. Taking it out of their so, hand. Yeah. So they're not opposites because community, we, we know this from, from alcohol and driving. We know this from smoking. We know this, that sometimes it's a mixture of the social more, which is the internal drive of society and the government's action. Uh, we, we very often saw this with, uh, with uh, drink uh, and driving. Very often governments introduce the law to criminalize the driving while with alcohol. And over time, doing that became socially unacceptable anyway. So now the law is not needed because the idea of, you know, drinking uh, half a bottle of whiskey and taking your car keys to your car is so unacceptable socially. Uh, so I do think sometimes we have the same thing with plastic bags in shops. You know, we want to stop plastics and governments introduced a tax on plastic bags. Uh, and people were very, very resistant to that. And then people stopped using plastic bags. And now I think if you walked into a shop with a plastic bag in your hand, people will look at you uh, because the, the social attitude is changing. So I do think in terms of human behavior, it's not always just purely driven by society changing what it does or, or complying. Uh, it's also does need sometimes uh, the government to guide society and make some rules. But if you, if we do think in the modern world that draconian measures imposed by government are going to be successful, I think that's just as silly as thinking everybody will do the right thing every time, even if you don't tell them to do so. You know? Isn't it working in North Korea? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I take it from extrapolating from what you just said, then um, every there, there's no one fix it for getting us out of, uh, yeah, every country is gonna have to find the, the right balance between personal responsibility and, and government uh, dictate. Yes, and there are principles that guide that. Uh, and I mean, from, from our perspective, and you know, you, I've heard you guys say it too, uh, it, this is about the number one, you know, in order to make progress in any part of your life, you've got to recognize where you are. There is no destination without understanding where you are. Uh, and therefore, some countries have not looked realistically at where they are in their response. 
and understanding, we, yes, we do have significant community transmission and we have got to get that under control before we can start doing other things. So a realistic assessment, data-based assessment of where each country is, a, a fundamental understanding of the strength of their public health and health architecture and where it needs to be strengthened. There's no point saying we're going to have test, track and trace. We're going to do that if you don't have trained workers. There's no point committing to a strategy of aggressive testing if you don't have the tests. So, you know, it's one thing to buy into a strategy. It's another thing to underwrite that strategy. So countries need to be honest and realistic about where they are in the event and the response. They need to be honest and realistic about the resources they have and which extra resources they're going to need. They need to set a strategy uh, and they need to go break that down every two weeks and say, we go, this is what we do. Two weeks, we look, we change, we move again. And there has to be that ability to continually evaluate, see where you are, and be honest enough to say, this isn't working, let's try it. let's do this now. The problem in the modern world is it's very hard to do that because everything governments do is done in the public eye, in real time, 24-hour news cycles. Uh, and that's very, very difficult. The world has changed from that perspective too. Uh, and historically, governments could implement all kinds of policy uh, outside the glare of the 24-hour news cycle. Uh, and I think that's changed and, and we're all adapting to that. And, and it's a good thing, it brings transparency, but it can also bring this whack-a-mole, uh, pendular swinging thing where uh, we, we, we really don't want to be setting public policy based on opinion polls. You know, that's not the way to assess health policy or public health response policy, you know? Right. What's WHO's position on emergency use authorization of vaccines? Didn't you use them for Ebola? Yeah, we used uh, an investigational use uh, protocol for both therapeutics uh, and for vaccine in Ebola in, in, in Kivu, most recently over the last year and a half. Um, emergency use authorizations or emergency use listings exist uh, around the world. In general, in the past, they are, have often been used for low incidence, high impact diseases, where you have someone who's very, very ill, uh, for which there's a therapy that's unproven, where the risk of death without the therapy is very high, and where you could have a, an, an off-label or emergency use listing for a given drug to be used uh, in a sort of uh, a trial type situation, not a randomized control trial, but in which there's a higher level of monitoring and a higher level of, level of data collection. Where the, where, the, where the therapeutic is actually given a provisional or emergency license for use. But that doesn't mean the, 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 the drug or vaccine just gets pushed out there, usually in association with an emergency use listing or an emergency use authorization. There is a requirement from the regulatory authority for a much higher level of monitoring and data collection. So number one, any adverse events can be tracked. And number two, it can add to the body of knowledge because sometimes the very reason the drug or the vaccine has been put through EUA is that there isn't enough data from trials to support the use of it properly as a pre-qualified or licensed product. Uh, so, for example, in Congo, with the MURI trial for, for therapeutics, we collected millions of data points uh, for the vaccine and for the therapeutic. In fact, there's a warehouse full of paper for all the information we collected and then electronic data collected on every patient, informed consent, and many other procedures that were very similar to a clinical trial situation. Um, the, um, um, in this case, and I think this is where we have to be uh, uh, quite careful in the case of uh, in a COVID vaccine, uh, deciding on the licensing of, or even the emergency listing of a COVID vaccine will effectively mean that we're putting hundreds of millions, if not billions of doses of a new product into perfectly healthy people who don't have any disease. Uh, and therefore the requirements on safety and efficacy become much higher because your tolerance for, for any adverse event goes way down because you're giving this to perfectly healthy people. Right. Um, and therefore you have to be absolutely sure that this product is safe. You know that there are certain side effects that show up in the, potentially in the first thousand patients you, 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 you give a vaccine to. There are some that may show up in the first 30,000 and there are some rare adverse events that may not show up until you've vaccinated uh, 100 million people. So you, there's still a huge requirement for monitoring. So yes, speed is important. We want to accelerate 
the availability of an effective vaccine. We're all struggling to live with this virus. There is no prospect, I think, realistically, uh, that we can get to zero COVID right now, given the, the situation in the world. I can't see us being able to eliminate this virus without the availability of a safe and effective vaccine. We can live with this virus, and we can find a way to live with this virus even without a vaccine. But a vaccine will be a hugely beneficial thing. But we, my own personal view is we should push, but not rush, you know, uh, we need to get the right speed to do this at, and we need to be absolutely sure that before we put this vaccine into general populations, whether it's an emergency use listing or a full licensing, David, it doesn't matter what the mechanism is. The vaccine has to be, in my view, proven to be safe and efficacious before any listing, emergency use or otherwise. Mm. There can be no shortcuts on this, because to expand the use of that vaccine to potentially billions of people places a higher level, I think, uh, of requirement on safety in this particular case. One last question, Joe, if you could put up slide number two real quick. So what's the impact COVID-19 had on program to control TB, HIV, malaria, polio, and uh, even uh, Ebola? Um, well, we're seeing impacts already. I mean, some of the impacts we're, that, are, that we're seeing are modeled impacts. What will happen if uh, health services don't return? What will happen if people stop getting treated for HIV? What will happen if? So there's a, there's a number of what if studies that are uh, worrying, uh, but some of those services are coming back online. Um, but there are impacts already in terms of, uh, you know, uh, safe attended births, immunization rates uh, for newborns in many countries have dropped. Um, in many countries, outpatient attendance has gone way down. Screening services for cancer have gone way down. Much of that loss, to be honest, in many countries has been down to people being nervous to attend healthcare facilities. In fact, in a recent survey that we've completed, the single biggest reason for people not getting access to healthcare was not having access to the healthcare because of lack of public transport or being people been fearful of attending the outpatients. It wasn't to do with the health service delivery. It was to do with logistics issues and issues about concern. So it's not just that the health system didn't deliver. People lost confidence in attending healthcare and society's capacity to get people to healthcare diminished with the lack of public transport and other things. So it's a complex issue. Um, I do believe that we're going to see, we are seeing immediate health impacts in the non-COVID sphere. We will continue to see those impacts in the coming months and years as systems struggle to recover. Um, and uh, we are, uh, as WHO, carrying out some very detailed surveys on all of that uh, and working very closely with our colleagues in the, in the health systems department that in HIV, TB, malaria, and the Global Fund and others to truly understand what the long-term impacts will be. But there's no question in my mind that the, the emergency called the COVID pandemic will is killing many people, and not all of the people that COVID kills will be killed by the virus. But some people will have negative health outcomes because they haven't been able to access services during the COVID pandemic. That, that I think, is a given. The question is, what is the extent of that excess mortality? And how are we going to measure it properly? And again, how are we going to measure it in a way that it doesn't become yet another political football? Can we actually measure this without it getting politicized? Because it's important that we do measure this. Uh, but uh, I have a fear that this is, will be the next big political football if we're not careful. Mike, we've run out of time. I'm, I, we very much appreciate you being with us today. You stick with us. Uh, Dale, over to you. Yeah, thanks, thanks Mike. It's uh, so good to, uh, to, to, to be close to you again and, uh, and hear you. I can't, really can't wait to, uh, you've got to get me over to Geneva I'm wearing, sometime. I'm wearing my Goran lanyard, uh, Dale, and out of respect to your, to your, uh, your leadership. But believe me, we, we notice every press conference. <laughs> okay, so um, I've just got uh, a few things I'd like to, to, to finish off with today. Um, the, uh, obviously, the, the news on the uh, University of Oxford uh, AstraZeneca vaccine, I'll have, just have a little comment on that. Uh, we've been asked some questions about saliva testing. Uh, I did want to have it, since it was uh, 
we've got um, Mike on board. I wanted just to have a, a word on Goan and a bit of a shout, shout out, a little bit of a reminiscence over the last 22 webinars and, uh, and Yakshagana, wait for that one. Okay, so um, as I think is, is common news, uh, the, the AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine uh, has, uh, they've, they've stopped enrollment. Uh, so this is a vaccine that uses modified chimpanzee adenovirus vector. Uh, and it's with that, it carries the coronavirus genetic components. And that's how it uh, plans to safely stimulate a, uh, a response, uh, an immune response. So uh, there is a rumor going around. Uh, it's been given anonymously. Uh, so it, it, it may be true or it, it may not. Uh, certainly the, the company uh, or the PIs of the, of the study have not made comments yet to my knowledge, but it's that a, a UK volunteer in a phase two, three uh, study there has been diagnosed with transverse myelitis. So I just thought uh, I might give a comment on this. Uh, the process is, is fine. Uh, all such studies uh, are overseen by uh, DSMBs, Data Safety Monitoring Boards. Um, it's, uh, so, so what is happening is normal. I must say it's a little bit scary because we know another inflammatory neurological condition, uh, Guillain-Barre, was linked to influenza vaccines in the past. So, so this is concerning if it's true. Uh, this is just for those non-medical particularly, that this is an inflammation in the spinal cord at a particular level. So what you could expect to see is, is all the spinal cord below there. Um, there'll be sensory uh, deficits from that level. Uh, there could be pain at that level and there'll be uh, weakness and possibly bladder and bowel disturbance below that level. So, so this is what, uh, what transverse myelitis looks like. Um, and if this is indeed a problem with the vaccine, then this is, is clearly serious. Um, but what it, obviously uh, things happen to people anyway, and what, that's what they'll be trying to look at is, uh, was this really something promoted by this virus and this vaccine, or was it coincidence? Um, and frankly, we don't even know if it's in the placebo arm or the, or the active arm yet. So um, this will play out a little bit, but that's just so you are informed. Uh, just to talk uh, a viewer, uh, a a self-confessed regular viewer asked me to, to comment on, uh, on saliva testing. So uh, I, I contacted two Singapore experts, being uh, Raymond Lin from NPHL and, and Su Liang, who's, who's well known through the uh, School of Public Health. So I just thought I'd take you through it. It's, it's a kit um, where you might uh, be trying to fill this, okay? So what you do is you gargle saliva in, in your mouth, so it's like this, uh, to create saliva, and then you spit in this, in this uh, little container, right? Remove the mask, obviously. Then you do it with the nose, which is a... Can't believe I'm doing it in front of thousands of people. <laughs> but anyway, you do that, and then you put it there, and you keep going backwards and forwards until this jar is, is full to the, the red line, and then you can see you, you uh, put, the, put the top on this, you shake it backwards and forwards, put it in the Ziploc bag, and that's the alternative to, uh, to the, the swab, just so that, so that people would know. So uh, where is this being used now? Uh, sometimes it's being used at airport screening. Obviously, you don't need people to do the swabs. Um, it is, we think it's being used widely in Hong Kong, but we noticed it wasn't being used with the mass screening now that was still swabbing. And, and I know there are trials happening, uh, including in Singapore. Um, when would you do it? Um, the lab has to be happy. It's, a, it's, a, it's obviously a much more viscous um, thing. So there's actually steps, uh, an extra step or two in the laboratory. Uh, for instance, the pipette can get get blocked if you haven't sort of, I guess, emulsified it. So, um, so you might use it when people are refusing nasopharyngeal uh, and maybe also if it's supervised. Um, why not? Well, people still aren't completely comfortable with it. Um, there are obviously publications, there'll be a, a, a bias. Um, 
uh, certainly a publication bias because if people find that it, it doesn't give good results, then they probably wouldn't bother publishing it. Um, there's variable techniques. There's also uh, a drooling approach and, and, and other ways, a, a sponge where you can get saliva that way. So there's a few different ways to do it. Um, which patients you do it on, as I say, you need another step in the lab. If you're doing pooled specimens, apparently it's very hard to get five together uh, and do the test like you might if you were, if you were doing nasopharyngeal swabbing in, in low risk communities. So it, it does take longer, the throughput in the lab would be less. And if you're doing it at home, would you actually trust the technique I just showed you? It's not quite straightforward. Um, and uh, and w would, you, would you trust the technique? Because people have probably would, uh, uh, many people would like to have a negative result. So maybe they may not try so hard. So, so there's a few question marks still out there. This is why it's not being used, um, but I think it's another space to watch. Okay, I'm now going to move on to a couple of words on, on Goan, and Mike was a, a founding father of this, but I just want to show a couple of slides, which I think I've shown before on this forum, that this is uh, 2001 Uganda, Ebola's, Ebola free, so they're ending the outbreak. You can see teams of contact tracers and, and all these other various ops people and things, uh, doctor, uh, but I want you to look at this, this uh, uh, signboard in the background. And, and there it is. This was, was done by, by Yotti, I believe, Mike. I don't know if you were even there, possibly. Um, but you can see the pillars of an outbreak response and also the, the different components in a particular setting that might help those pillars. And this, this morphed into a famous Goan graphic, um, which is all the pillars of, of an immune response, uh, sorry, immune response, a, uh, a, an outbreak response. Uh, and and it really, if any of these fail, then you're really compromising the whole outbreak response. And we always think about case management and epidemiology, but logistics are easy to get wrong. And this one, risk communication, community engagement is often, uh, often forgotten about. And that's indeed what we're seeing in this outbreak with the countries perhaps not doing so well, uh, are, are doing less well because of the coordination and the community buy-in is not as successful. And, and of course, uh, I applied that to, to the dormitories and, and I've shared this graphic around a lot. So the reason I'm showing this is because um, we, we owe it to, um, to go on. Don't know why that slide's not working. It, it's an organization of about 250 um, uh, institutions around the world, uh, Red Cross, MSF, the, all the CDCs in China, Africa, Nigeria, US, um, Europe. Um, UNICEF, all the epidemiology networks. So it's it's a huge network. One of one of WHO's uh, uh, jewels in the crown, I guess. Um, and then I just wanted to give uh, a bit of a shout out to the uh, uh, operational support team. Uh, and I won't read out all these names, but you can see, and they're, they're often seconded from some of these organisations. So you can see C China CDC, Public Health. CDC, the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs, um, Robert Koch Institute, uh, Korea CDC, UNICEF, um, the uh, Public Health uh, Agency of Canada, um, often uh, doing uh, great contributions uh, on behalf uh, or with the, uh, the, the global operational support team. And, and these uh, people down the bottom are, are placed in the regions as the regional operational support team. Uh, and here's uh, a, a little picture with a bit of a, a shout out to these. They're not all there, but um, you can see uh, Pat, who's coming on next week, and uh, JC, Sam, uh, Christine, Ramon. No, once I start mentioning people, I have to say everyone. Anyway, Renee, I'm on. So, so thanks everyone for all the work that you've done. So I just thought, um, David, we're, we're nearing the end of the, the series and we may not have time next week. I just thought it might be nice to reflect on our 23 um, magnificent guests that uh, started strong with, with clinicians and virologists and, and, uh, and, and political uh, geopoliticians, I guess, uh, experts, um, immunologists, uh, all, all the, the guns from around the world and, and with a focus on Singapore. 
uh, started strong, finished strong with, with uh, Maria, Jeremy, Mike, Chow Bin, Peter Horby. And, uh, and of course, it was fantastic in the middle. So we've been really pleased that we've been able to pull uh, such a, a team together to, to really give us and the, and the audience uh, such a learning experience. And, and I think that's also been part of our privilege to, to be able to, to learn from these, these people. Uh, every week we've, uh, we've gone through some talking points and I think in many ways we've been influential. Uh, we've, we've explained a lot to the audience about masks and, and uh, uh, the public spraying and the disinfection tunnels. Um, the, uh, we, we were called the poster child of the outbreak until, until this happened when we had suddenly a thousand cases a day in the dormitories. So, so I think... Um, I think we've we've had an incredible journey. We've we've shown how the importance of community engagements and 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 done various countries. We featured WHO and their efforts uh, one week, and we've talked about all-cause mortality, which Mike was just touching on then, and contact tracing. Done the ACT accelerator a couple of times. Um, all all these things, I think, are nice to to reflect back on second infections was was recent so we've also tried to stay topical but we've also tried to keep it a bit light and this has been constant feedback from from people is that it's fantastic that when you when you're down and all these depressing stories are happening um, that, that we can still find uh, good things and you, you, you might remember the breathing exercise in the dormitory yards and the this is the Nurses' Day uh, collaborative from NUHS. This is MSF at the end of the Ebola outbreak, the, the famous clapping in every city, uh, the flyovers on National Day, the, the great nature from, uh, from Fei Fung, um, this amazing clone, uh, clone drone video from, uh, from South Korea. And of course, uh, last week we had... Uh, spoke about messaging with Bobby Wine and Nubian Lee. And, and I must say, most of these things are on YouTube if anyone wants to, to find them and, and see them again. And, and of course, all our, uh, all our productions are on YouTube as well. Um, so this brings me to the last one, David. Um, Yakshagana, apologies for the pronunciations. I'd like to shout out to Prakash Handa from the Department of Physiology at NUS. He says he's a regular watcher of our updates and he suggested this to me and, and contacted the, um, the producer of, of, of the work. So Yakshagana troops, um, uh, it's a traditional uh, puppetry art from, from Kanataka and, and North Kerala, so from, from this area. Um, and, and they had to stop doing their work uh, in March because of, uh, because of COVID. So they've had some sponsors and more recently started doing some some uh, some work with um, online. So this Yakshagana traditional Italian theater uh, that has evolved into Corona Yakshaga Gathri or something. Um, and that's Corona awareness through Yakshagana and it combines dance, music, dialogue, costumes, and it's, it's very neat. I'm not gonna read out all these people, but, uh, but great job to all of you. Uh, I just wanna show you a a two minute video how the demon called Corona creates viruses to invade countries. And then uh, Lord Dan Bantry, who's, who's, uh, who's this one, who's the God of medicine, uh, advises King Regenda about the duties of medicine who, who, who uh, and, and all the things that the, he needs to command his, uh, his people to do uh, in order to defeat the coronavirus. So spend two minutes and watch this please. It's, uh, it's a lot of fun. Me? <laughs> 
my duty to protect my people. Hey, Dhanvantari, you are the only protector. We bow in front of you. Deva, we bow in front of you. The only basic rule for this is stay home, stay safe. Huh. Your duty is to read this information to common people as a rule. Huh. It is necessary to get out of your home quickly, wear face mask, huh. maintain huh. social distance, huh. increase your immunity by healthy food, hmm. regular exercise including breathing exercise. This disease can be avoided by following these rules. Huh. Instruct your people to follow these rules. Rajendra, huh. don't worry, I will manage him. Stay home, stay safe. Oh. There lies the well-being of Bharat So there's obviously a much longer version of that. If you if you want to look, I I, I had it on the uh, on the last screen. But uh, good community engagement, I think. Uh, reggae for some, but uh, yakshagana for others. Thanks, David. Dale, thanks so much. It leaves me to thank Dr. Ryan uh, for sharing his thoughts uh, with us, and uh, we re very much appreciate his his expertise and his devotion to his work, uh, which I'm sure has consumed most of his time in the last six months, and taking time from his busy day to be with us. Next week will be the 24th and last in our series. The episode's format will change. There'll be guest speakers from around the world. As with all our episodes, you'll find it educational, inspirational, and we hope powerful. Please make a special effort to join us and tell your friends and colleagues to watch as well. The theme of our final webinar episode will be global solidarity. There's a chat box at the bottom of your screen. Please use it. It'll be open for 10 minutes. We look forward to your comments as always. Until next week, stay safe, wear your mask and wash your hands. We have two pandemic songs of the week. First, from long-term uh, updates from Singapore follower Ko Zin Ting. It's not a song, but a pandemic album of the week called Apocalypse and Chill by the band Dulan. Our second pandemic song of the week is keeping with last week's reggae happy tune. It's Bob Marley's classic, Don't Worry About a Thing, because every little thing's going to be all right. Good night. Critical question that all countries will face in the coming months is how to live with this virus. That is the new normal.